Hello. Trent here. I am way out in the fields. Oops, sorry. Hello. How you doing? Thanks for joining me. Um, so this is part of the of our property that people don't often see because we don't often show it. There's not much to show. It's just a grass pasture, uh, which has slowly turned into weeds. <laughs> and uh, you know, when we first got the goats years ago, and after that got a cow, we actually managed to. Well, we managed to manage it pretty well, actually. I'll show you what I mean. So we sectioned this whole, uh, probably four acre, three or four acre um, area. I sectioned it off into approximately 16 foot sections and had electric fencing um, dividing those things. And we had the grazing animals out here on one section at a time. And uh, we intensely grazed the areas. Uh, we let the animals graze them down till they were till they were really um, eaten down to to not much. But we didn't let them overgraze. Um, in other words, we didn't want them to be uh, digging up the roots and stuff. But um, from what I've read, that seems to be the way to properly manage. Um, prairie or grassland of any kind. The problem that we had was that we just didn't have enough animals on this big acreage. Um, in retrospect, we would have had one cow or maybe five or six goats per acre, whereas we had just uh, two goats at one point that were grazing a couple acres and of course the cow on uh, the three or four acres, whatever this this area happens to be actually more than that. This pasture back here, uh, the open space is three or four acres, but uh, she had free reign of, of all this stuff behind me too. So basically just um, too much grass and not enough cow. <laughs> so my point being that, uh, sorry, I am shaky because I'm gathering up some of this electric wire. I'll explain what I'm doing here in a second. So the, the problem or else when we didn't have enough animals per acreage and um, the grass got away from us and because it wasn't being grazed intensely, the animals would just go through and um, when we had them in a section, they would nibble on the, the sweetest new young grass that they liked, whatever variety that was. I almost said brand, whatever brand of grass that was. And they'd leave the weeds and leave the other grass that was a little bit more um, uh, uh, what's the word? It, it, would, it would take over more. Rambunctious grass, <laughs> if you want to say that. <laughs> um, and it would, uh, you know, so that the grass that we didn't want, that was invasive, invasive, that's the word, would take over and it would, uh, so uh, long story short, it would leave, it basically left nothing but uh, weedy pasture back here. And that's what I have burned up. That's because what eventually came was this terrible weed that we, uh, we were actually excited about when we first moved here because we, we surveyed the property on foot and we were so excited that all these sunflowers were growing. Well, the, it turns out that they are in the sunflower family, but they're called, um, and if you have these, get rid of them because they are terrible. They're called giant sump weed and there are several other names for them. It took us years to find out what they were, but you do not want them. They, uh, once they go to seed or go to, you know, and start to, uh, uh, giving off their pollen. They are apparently the um, number one culprit when it comes to hay fever and uh, you know uh, seasonal allergies in general. Turns out that it's the number one culprit. Can't believe it. And we have it growing in abundance in our property. Um, so those things took over. 
the invasive grasses took over, essentially you're left with matted, dead invasive grass and not much good grass, not much stuff that animals will want to eat. And um, basically there's nothing left to do but burn it. Now, this is another method of taking care of, of grassland, prairie, pasture, whatever you want to call it, um, all of the above. Um, so I was reading this in a, it's called Prairie Sky Journal. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it comes out of Montana, but it, it kind of covers the Intermountain West area. Just uh, things of interest to farmers and, and agricultural people. Anyway, it says it, it was a kind of an interesting article about how um, how grasslands um, in wild um, basically they they burn naturally. You know, lightning strikes somewhere and the, the fire spreads, and it never gets too terribly big, um, too hot. It doesn't kill the roots of the plants. It just uh, kind of wipes out the dead stuff, wipes out the weeds, gives the uh, pollinators, poll poll plants that pollinators like, gives them a chance to come through the grass. And you can go look that up if you want. <laughs> or not necessarily that article, but I'm sure there's plenty of it on the, on the web. But, um, but we proved this, that uh, good grass comes back in, in its stead after a good fire. And we've never, tried it this early in spring before. We always typically wait till, till the grass is a little bit higher and uh, we burn it and it kind of comes back weeds. But this time when we burned, and hopefully we're not too late here, I don't think we are. We're still in the rainy cold season here. But um, this other part that I'll show you in a minute um, was early enough that yeah, it took care of the weeds, took care of the matted dead grass, and all we got, all we have coming up now is this fresh, new, beautiful green grass. Eventually I'll make it over there. It's kind of a long walk from one corner to the other. Now here's a good example of what happens when the cow isn't grazing. This used to be where I would have buttercup come through and um, go out to the pastures, and it was just, eaten down to nothing, but as soon as we didn't have her here, you know, the weeds take over. And this actually happens to be a, a good weed. Um, gum weed is one name for it. And uh, so we don't mind having it around, and it's beautiful in the fall. But uh, those kind of things. Um, other weeds take over when you don't have fire to manage it or, or a grazing animal. Well, while I'm walking over there, I'll explain what I was doing here. So I'm taking out all of the electric fencing out there, trying to clear it out so we can get a tractor back there uh, to till it, to plow it and till it, and get it ready to plant one of two things. Well, one of two categories of things. Either grain, it's probably winter wheat that we plant in uh, November, well, October, October, November, something like that. I can't remember the exact date <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, you plant it and you don't have to water it and that's a big deal out here in the desert. And it comes up strong in the springtime, about this time of year. It's already a couple inches tall. So taking the electric fencing out that used to be there to manage the, the cow. I'll set that down for a second on a stump. And uh, make room for either the, uh, sorry, I'm thinking about what I'm seeing here <laughs> instead of talking. So make room for either the wheat or some of the grain or wildflowers and uh, maybe possibly not as useful in the uh, short measurable term, but possibly far more useful in the long term as far as just um, giving uh, life and 
and uh, food to uh, pollinators. That's really important to us. Yeah, it's beautiful too. Who doesn't want a field full of flowers? So, okay, here we are out here. Obviously we passed the house, um, past the front yard. We're in the other corner of the property. And this is what we've burned uh, just recently. It's been about three weeks now, two and a half, three weeks. And it's gorgeous. Really, really green. And you can tell quite easily where we didn't burn. Um, well, first of all, we didn't want the fire to go beyond our, our property line. And so you can see the stark contrast there between our property and the neighbor's property, where we were careful to not let it go over there. But um, the neighbor's property is an um, accurate representation of what, what ours did look like. Once we get over here, you'll see it. You'll see it even more clearly. And our hose only extended out. You can see this kind of big sweeping arc, and that's as far as our hose would reach. So that's a, that's why we only went that far. We didn't want it to go over to the neighbor's weeds and and burn that without her wanting it. So this is what it used to look like. Three weeks later, it's gorgeous and green. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, of course, this is going to grow tall, and without animals to control it and eat it, we're going to run into the same problems that we did before. A um, couple of different options that we have. Number one, get more animals. Don't think we're ready for a cow again. I will uh, say it till the day I die that I loved that cow, and she was a good animal but it's awful hard to have a cow and do anything else at all. You can't be a hand milker or maybe even a cow, a cow owner of any kind and, uh, and choose to have any other career, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> maybe in slower times it, it would have been possible, but uh, not for me and not now. Anyway, so we could get other animals, we can get goats, which I kind of have learned to ooh, tolerate when necessary um, because uh, we love trees very much. We baby our trees and uh, the goats love to eat our baby trees. So we don't love goats on our property and goats always, always find a way to get out. Another option is sheep. We have thought about it, but uh, We've kind of honestly enjoyed our freedom to travel when we want to, leave home for a few days and not have to worry about um, someone taking care of big animals. Um, seems like the smaller the animal, the easier it is to let them sort of fend for themselves though for a short term. So that is still an option for sure. And uh, if I'm true to myself, I really do miss having animals. And uh, I think that's in the plans for sure. <laughs> Um, so that's the one option is to get other animals and to have them graze them, graze it down and take care of everything. The other option is to kill the grass. Within that, we've got sub options and, you know, lots of different things. I'll show you though, two. First of all, well, I've got a piece of black plastic out there that's a little worse for wear. But that is option number one, and I don't have a good example to show you because I haven't done it yet. But we've heard from several people now that have had great success with laying out black plastic. It has to be pretty heavy duty so it doesn't rip through the first time. First time it, the, the wind blows it around. But uh, you just lay this on an area and turn it around here. And after four to six weeks, it basically kills off the grass that was under it. And this grass is so invasive, it just, it kills, the roots take over. They create this matted mess under everything. And it's really hard for trees such as this that I recently planted to grow with all those grass roots that are um, taking, taking away nutrients and, um, you know, just taking up the space that the, that these roots 
would otherwise take. Anywhere else, and in our other properties, we've um, I've had great luck just planting poplars and willows in the yard. Any any tree really, we plant it and it grows. And we're sort of good at that. I don't know. It, it just we just sort of figured it out. But here, it's a whole other story, and uh, trees only grow where we baby them, pay so much attention, keeping the grass under control, keeping the weeds out, keeping the voles away from the roots. Lots of problems with planting little trees here. But uh, if we had a big enough piece of plastic, you know, say like enough to cover a couple hundred square feet at least, no, that's not even enough, more like a quarter acre at least, a um, couple hundred square feet is not that big. Our last garden here was a third of an acre. That's why we sort of got burned out. It was just a lot to take care of. Um, and the grass was a big part of that. So, moving on. Plastic, black plastic. Or, uh, the thing that I never wanted to do is to spray it with grass killer spray over the top and there are several brands that we've considered and it's kind of funny because we've uh, we've bought this stuff for several years every every single spring we say well this is the year that we're gonna just just do it and then uh, we'll wait three years and then finally grow edibles and medicinals in those in those parts um, we've tried many other options we have tried the plastic before and it works very temporarily, and four to six weeks is a long time to wait you know, when in the growing, growing season. It's a lot of lost time. And uh, so we have decided just to finally do it. I know I say that, but <laughs> it's gonna be hard um, to use this poison on our property. We don't want chemicals because we're, you know, we're trying to grow herbs and fruits and vegetables in these beds that I'm going to show you now. And in the springtime they start to look pretty good. We've got all kinds of beautiful bulbs and things coming up, uh, but also plenty of grass. Start Just starting to take over. Some oregano, hollyhock, which by the way is entirely edible. Everything in it is. And, uh, wait, is that a hollyhock? Just kidding. It is. Um, tastes kind of like peas. It's yummy. Or raw green beans. Um, so, we've got all this edible stuff in here that we don't really want to render inedible for this entire season. And probably, to be safe, a couple years after that. So it's not a decision we take lightly at all. As I said, we've spent, well, spent several years and quite a couple hundred dollars at least buying chemicals that we've never used. We just don't have the heart to do it. But uh, I think you'll see here that uh, this grass is not going away. And we are very definitely going to have to take care of it chemically. Uh, we're waging chemical warfare on this grass, not just here, but around the trees. Probably um, a good wide swath, maybe uh, five feet um, radius around every single one. And that'll buy us enough time each season to, um, to let the trees um, kind of just have a fighting chance. I mean, they're, they're all right. They're not dying necessarily and the grass roots themselves are not necessarily killing them but the grass roots do leave plenty of space or plenty of food rather and nesting areas for the voles and uh, um, pocket gophers and you can see some of their tracks in here that they've made under the snow um so i guess that's that i uh I've just started working on the tools, replacing spark plugs, and uh, gonna probably have to replace um, 
distributors, distributor caps on both of these things. Give them nice tune-ups. Something I am not great at. Hello, birds. Something I'm not great at, but um, need to get better at. So I'm gonna practice thanks to YouTube. <laughs> I'll look up how to do it and just do it. Um, okay, all right, this has been really long. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, as I say goodbye, I'm just gonna show you the state of our trees real quick. Get a sneak peek of all these trees that we planted from sticks years ago. If you remember, those of you who were with us um, when I first started YouTube, you remember that we planted a bunch of sticks out here They've gotten quite big now. Shoulder height here. 10 feet tall there. And the closer we get to this uh, re regenerating wood pile, in other words, this is where we always um, plop the wood chips, the mulch, uh, the closer we get to that pile, the taller the trees get. Look at the huge difference this is. Fifteen feet there, and obviously quite healthy. Anyway, great lesson there. Plant uh, wood chips, or sorry, plant trees 